This appears that it was not a random attack. It appears to be targeted. So I don't think the Forney community at large is in danger. The best thing we can do is remain calm, uh, remain supportive of the McClellan family and those that are handling the investigation, and then continue to look out for each other. The county courthouse here in Kaufman County is open for business, but as you mentioned, with extra security, the DA's office is closed to the public. Shep. Dan Springer in Kaufman, Texas, for us this afternoon. Dan, thanks a lot. Let's bring in Judge Napolitano, our senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano, with us from our New York City studios. Judge, 25 years or so been doing this. I can't remember retaliation on law enforcement officials. No, I can't either, Shep, and certainly not two law enforcement officials who work together on the same cases. Cases that, of course, the FBI and the Texas Rangers and, and their own colleagues are now mulling over to see who, who had the gripe what, what common threads are there between the professional work that these two now deceased prosecutors did and, and who would want to have uh, killed them. It's, uh, it's terrifying. Well, that could be a long list. It, it probably is. It's terrifying when you go to work in the morning to do your job and you know that out there it could be very close to you or distant but getting closer is somebody who wants to kill you for doing your job of keeping people uh, safe. Um, whether whether it's the Aryan the brother feds, or not, whether it's sorry, connected it's a to this. a satellite delay. I apologize. Say again? I, I, there was a satellite delay, and I jumped on you, and I didn't mean to. Oh, again, right. you were saying whether it's the Aryan Brotherhood. Well, whether it's the Aryan Brotherhood, whether there's a connection between the uh, assassination uh, of the chief of the Department of Corrections in Colorado, who was a, the killer was eventually, the presumed killer was eventually chased to Texas and killed there, we don't know. But we do know that no stone will be un, uh, unturned that the federal government and the state of Texas will pour massive resources into finding who did this and protecting those people who keep the people safe. The people are entitled to a government that works and a government that's not afraid to do its job. And whoever is out there trying to interfere with the government doing its job by means of violence will be caught and stopped. And continuing coverage, including an update tonight on Fox Report. Judge Napolitano, thanks so much. Well, prosecutors in the case against the man accused of killing 12 and injuring nearly 70 others when he opened fire in a crowded Colorado movie theater say he deserves to die for that crime. District attorneys there saying planning to seek the death penalty against James Holmes now, but will they have a hard time proving that he's mentally competent? To figure out how this all works, Fox News senior judicial analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano joins us live. Good morning, morning guys. Good morning. All right, so. You know, last week, his uh, defense people said, okay, let's make a deal. We will go ahead and he will plead guilty if you promise not to execute. You know, usually these deals are not made in public. Usually they're announced after they're done. And the deal itself uh, consists of a lot of negotiating between the defense counsel, the prosecutor, and ultimately the judge is brought in. The judge has to make sure the deal is basically just, sure. basically fair, and both sides uh, want to do it. So for the defense to say through the media, we want to plead guilty and have a life without parole uh, is unusual, Why but not unprecedented. That? Well, they might want to put a little pressure on the prosecutors to accept this guilty plea mm -hmm. because a death penalty prosecution will cost the state of Colorado millions of dollars, will, uh, will tear open the hearts of the, of the survivors of the sure. victims, and will take five to six years between the trial, the appeals, and execution if it actually happens. The other interesting thing that you point out, there's been a lot of discussion about whether or not James Holmes is actually sane or insane. Yes. And you're saying that there are, at every single point of a death penalty trial, he has to be found sane. He has to be, he has to have been sane at the time he committed the act. He has to be sane at the time of the trial, and he has to be sane at the time of the execution. This is all what the mm -hmm. Supreme Court has said is a necessary condition for execution in this country. So, first question is, is he sane now, at this moment? Can he participate in his trial and meaningfully help his lawyers? A judge will make that decision. If he is, they'll go to trial. Then the jury will decide, was he sane at the time he killed these people? Mm. His burden is to prove that he was insane. The state does not have to prove he was sane. He has to prove he was insane. Sure. Well, he certainly appears insane, what he, we've seen he, in court. But, you know, some have suggested maybe it's just crazy acting. Yes, which is why this case will, after all the testimony about the horrific events in that theater comes out, will basically be 
his psychiatrists mm -hmm. trying to persuade a jury that he's insane, basically meaning he didn't know right, right from wrong. He thought he was throwing ping pong balls rather than uh, murdering people. And the government psychiatrist saying he knew exactly what he's doing. He's a little nutty. He's not normal, but he knew right from wrong. And a jury will decide who they believe. Mm. All right. Judge Napolitano, as always, thanks we so much. We will be for living with this one for a while. Pleasure, guys. Have a great right. We are also watching for new fallout today after a federal judge lets Stockton, California, become the biggest American city ever to declare bankruptcy. Very unusual. The ruling opens the door for Stockton to maybe, potentially, possibly, we'll see, walk away from hundreds of millions of dollars in, pe in public pension payments that it owes. Something other cash-strapped cities in California could also try to do to deal with their ballooning debt. In fact, this could have potentially national relevance. As last year, unfunded pensions across this country equaled more than $4 trillion. Judge Andrew Napolitano is a Fox News senior judicial analyst. And this is so unusual because normally if you're a company and declare bankruptcy, you can liquidate your assets and sell them off one by one. Right. Stockton can't go selling City Hall. Right. So it's strange when you see a city declare right. bankruptcy. Right. When you and I were in law school, in my case in the Middle Ages, <laughs> uh, the professor said, what happens if the government declares bankruptcy? The students probably would have laughed. It was just unthinkable. It just doesn't happen. Somehow there'd be an increase in, in tax revenue or some sort of a bailout. I don't know what's going to happen now. Stockton is the tip of, a, is the beginning of a very, very long train. Stockton owes over $200 million to the people who lent it money for its everyday operations, its bondholders. And it owes over $900 million, almost a billion, to the California state pension system. This city only has 300,000 people that live there, and not all of them own real estate, and not all of them pay taxes. They can't afford that. So where is the money going to come from? One of the reasons they found themselves in that predicament we discussed with Stu Varney yesterday was you could work for the city for any short period of time, an unspecified short period of time, and get a lifetime pension for you plus a, de a dependent. I mean, you work for a year and pension for life? S Stewart is correct. This is reprehensible what the politicians did in order to get votes. How do they get votes? By giving these lavish deals to people who will continue to vote to keep them in office. Mm -hmm. they, they either never thought they'd run out of cash or they thought that the cash would run out not on their watch. They also, of course, wrote laws that would benefit themselves because the politicians making these laws would themselves become pensioners someday. Mm -hmm. So these pensions are lavish, it, it, generous, and non-contributory. It all, it well all comes from the taxpayer. It's all well and good when you make the promise, and it sounds great, let's help our firefighters. We know we want them to be taken care of. We want our police officers to be taken care of. But if the paper is not worth, if the deal is not worth the paper it's printed on, then it's not so great. And not just that, but now the citizens of Stockton judge, um, they've had to cut down health benefits, they've had to slash unemployment, they've had to renegotiate some of these labor deals, and they're saying they had to cut library and recreation funding, they've been cut in half. They've scaled down police department presence. Now the police department only responds to emergencies in progress. And the city crime rate is among the highest in the country right now, according to the Associated this Press. This is a direct response, a direct reaction, a causal relationship to the profligate ways that the people who ran this city a generation ago and even up to the present time uh, have been running it. What, that, what, what happens if this spreads beyond Stockton? Well, it will spread. You, you mentioned in your, uh, in your promo of, of this segment that uh, members of Congress, Congressman um, uh, Chaffetz in Arizona, has estimated, with, uh, with backup from the Congressional Budget Office, that the total unfunded liability of state and local governments for their pensions, that's pension payments they must make, which they do not now have, is in excess of four trillion dollars. So this Stockton bankruptcy is the first car in a very, very long train. Where is all this going to go? Probably to Washington. Stockton can't print cash. Washington can. But when it prints that cash, when it, when it borrows money from the Federal Reserve, which essentially creates the cash out of, out of thin air, it just pushes this burden to future generations of Americans in, in, in most cases as yet unborn. It's the Stossel clip. It. it is the Stossel clip that we showed the last hour. We've showed it many times again. This is the plan. This is the backup plan just in case we run out of pension money. John Stossel foresaw it all. Here it is. Watch it. Well, I need this, you know, and I need this. And I'm going to take this and no, no, I'm the old person. I need this. You have to take care of me. I want it. It's mine. 
Now, John is a genius. He is the foreseer of all. Correct. I mean, he, he is explaining in a basic fundamental way that even children can understand what the government is doing to us, what the government will do to your child as yet unborn. And it is reprehensible, it's immoral, it's not authorized by the Constitution, it ought to be criminal, and this is what they've saddled us with. Where are they going to get the $4 trillion? Mm -hmm. Most of the recipients of that $4 trillion are honest, hard-working people who planned their lives expecting to receive it. They believe the not deal. Correct. They believed the deal. It's not going to be there. Judge Knapps, thank you for me being here. Judge Pleasure. Napolitano, sorry, that's his little nickname internally. Knapps is fine. Thank you, my friend. <laughs> to the Denver Police Academy. In minutes, the president's expected to praise Colorado's gun control laws and tout his own plan. This, as New York Democrat Carolyn Maloney pushes a bill that would force gun owners to buy liability insurance or face a $10,000 fine. Question, is that legal? All rise. The judge, Andrew Napolitano, is here. This reminds me of Obamacare. Yes, it does. You either get out there and get insurance, or we're going to fine you. This is guns. If you don't get liability insurance, we'll fine you. Legal with Obamacare? Legal with guns? What do you well, say? Well, remember the way that the fine in Obamacare was characterized by the Supreme Court. The only way that federal government can fine you to coerce your behavior is to call it a tax. And if it is a tax, it must bear a financial relationship to the product you have declined. So the, the tax on Obamacare is roughly equivalent to, according to Mrs. Pelosi and company, who wrote that monstrosity, what the government's cost would be to purchase health care insurance for you because you're being, you're being taxed because you refuse to buy it. The government's going to take the tax dollars and buy it for you. Can't do that with guns. No, you can't, can't do say that, that with guns. guns. No. But, but in, in order for the court to find this to be a tax, the amount would have to be the rough equivalent of what a, an insurance policy or more properly a rider on your homeowner's insurance policy would cost. Okay. $10,000? No. grossly out of line, not even close to what that insurance policy would cost. It would cost you a, a small fraction of the $10,000. This proposal is symbolic. That's all it is. Well, it's, in my, in my it, opinion. it is more than symbolic. If, if it comes to pass, this will deter people from buying guns because the poor and the middle class will not be able to afford the insurance the state or the government will want you to buy or the $10,000 tax. It will be prohibitive. How could you enforce it? I, it'd be very difficult to enforce. Well, you could do the yeah. same thing as they do with Obamacare. Use the IRS. Right, right. So when you fill out your IRS return, do you own a gun? Yes. Prove that you have the insurance. I, right. I can't prove it. Okay, then add $10,000 to the check that you're sending us. I don't have the $10,000. Then we have an issue. What does that mean? Are they going to come and take your gun if you can't pay the $10,000 tax? Or is the whole purpose of this to burden the right to keep and bear arms, which the federal government may not constitutionally do? So this thing is not going to fly. Any way you slice it, we're not going to be forced to get insurance on our guns and pay a $10,000 fine if we don't have the insurance. Agreed. Not going to happen. It won't pass the House of Representatives. If it did, it wouldn't pass muster with the first federal judge to look at it. So, but we are talking about it, aren't we? Yes, we are. Does it demonstrate where the anti-gun people are coming from? I suspect it does. It demonstrates that there are, there, there's no hole too deep into which they won't jump to try and stop us from exercising the right to defend ourselves. You know, you've left it to the last few seconds of the show, and I, we don't have time for a comeback on that. Yeah, but one. you're about to put the president on right now. He's got the comeback. I believe so. Just how free are you? That might depend on the city or state that you call home. <laughs> Not this one. Mm -hmm. A new study by a libertarian think tank ranks the 50 states in order of personal freedoms. So how does yours stack up? Fox News senior judicial analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano is here to break them down. All right, are you going to start with the most free or are you going to start with the ones that have the grip around? Well, I, th I think we have a chart showing okay. the whole country and the, the most free are in green, North Dakota, South Dakota, not far from, uh, from where you're from, uh, Gretchen, Tennessee and New Hampshire. And the least free are in yellow, no surprise, New York, New Jersey, my home state, Rhode Island, California and Hawaii. Now, how do they how do they gauge this? Mm -hmm. They gauge this by the laws that the states impose that regulate personal, private behavior. In the most free states, that behavior, the size of the container out of which you drink your <laughs> soda pop, is unregulated by the government, and you are free to make to make choices. Look, there's good news and bad news here. The bad news is that there are states like New York, New York City, 
where the government thinks it can regulate private behavior. The good news is, as Ronald Reagan used to say, you can still vote with your feet. Sure. If you think the taxes are too high in New Jersey, you can move to Pennsylvania. If you think the regulation is too much in Massachusetts, you can move uh, to right. New Hampshire. And one of the components of whether or not your state is free, one of them is taxes. And here yes. in New York, it's terrible. And in California, yes, it's and, even worse. And where you and I live, the real estate taxes are notoriously the highest in the union. The uh, income tax is the highest in the state income tax, is the highest in the union because we have the fewest uh, deductions. I'm not critical of Governor Christie. These things were in place long before uh, he came but into judge, office. But, uh, Judge, if everybody uh, craves freedom, especially libertarians, why aren't people running to North Dakota? Why aren't they fleeing to South Dakota? <laughs> you have to he ask looks Gretchen. Like I'm, I'm looking at Gretchen. It's something <laughs> called winter, Brian. W I N T E R. I love you, North and South Dakota. I'll throw Minnesota in the you mix. Know, as because well. we got so many people here. The we got people who did this study are good friends of mine. They're at a think tank called the Mercatus Institute at George Mason University. They are serious academic scholars of freedom, and they do this every year. And every year, the states don't seem to change. So the only thing I can think of, Brian, is people's attitudes get acclimated to things. Mm -hmm. We live in New York, and we're accustomed to this heavy regulation. Sure. You live in South well, Dakota, there, and you're accustomed to freedom. Would you work out of the North Dakota Bureau? <laughs> Would you pledge right now? Mr. Ailes, do we have a North Dakota Bureau? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Hello, Fargo. <laughs> All right, Judge, thank you very much. Oh, pleasure, guys. Have a nice day, everybody. You as well. See you next time. Thanks. The sheriff in New Orleans for Orleans Parish today answering for that shocking video out of a jail he runs. The video came out during a federal hearing on improving conditions at the lockup. And look at this. Inmates smoking up, snorting, shooting some sort of drugs. Some of them are openly drinking beer, showing off wads of cash and cell phones. Now, mind you, they're in jail. Perhaps most disturbing, they're waving around a loaded gun, again, in jail. I don't have any way of knowing how old this video is, but it doesn't seem to much matter. Today, New Orleans City attorneys grilled the parish sheriff on the stand. Remember, parish is the same as a county. They call them parishes there. Officials blame him for the jail's bad condition. The video is their prime evidence. But when city attorneys asked the sheriff if he thought the jail was a bit dysfunctional, the sheriff said no. Let's take it to the judge. Fox News senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano, is live with us here in studio. I guess just because you have guns and people shooting up drugs and smoking and something out of a crack pipe looking thing there and waving around a loaded gun, I, that doesn't mean it's really dysfunctional. Oh, gosh. This, this sheriff is obviously desperately trying to keep on to his job. I mean, the ultimate purpose of this application before this federal judge is to remove him as the chief administrative officer of this jail. It's actually five different jails throughout the, the city of, uh, of the New parish, Orleans. Yeah. The, as you say, they're the, the, called the parish. It looks like they're lining up coke there in well, the jail. When, you know, when he was asked about this, he said, uh, yes. I don't know where this was made. I don't know who made it. I don't know if it's, uh, I don't know if it's doctored. And quite frankly, the court doesn't, doesn't know that either, either. But this is a notorious jail with reprehensible conditions, many of which he agreed to change in writing in response to a federal lawsuit. This proceeding today is to call him into account for his failure to make those changes. And the changes are profound, Shep. I, I, I read his agreed upon changes. It's 56 pages of changes. If you believe the lawyers for the city of New Orleans, he hasn't made any of them yet. Yeah. We're talking about basic things like taking care of somebody who's sick, reporting when prisoners arrive and when prisoners leave. What you don't see on that tape is some prisoners in their jumpsuits in the French Quarter when they were supposed to be in prison. Yeah, I think I've seen them. Uh, this video supposedly made in 2009, and the, the sheriff of Orleans Parish said he didn't remember seeing these detailed images until all of a sudden they showed up this week on television. Happy jail time to you and yours. This bud's for you. We'll be right back. Challenging freedom of the press in America, FoxNews.com reporter Jana Winter facing possible jail time as a Colorado judge wants her to name her source for an explosive story that she did about the accused Aurora movie theater murderer James Holmes. All of this despite a state law known as a shield law that protects journalists. Colorado shield law states this, quote, no news person shall without such news person's express consent be compelled to disclose, be examined concerning refusal to disclose, be subject to any legal presumption of any kind, or be cited, held in contempt, punished, or subjected to any sanction 
for refusing to disclose information obtained while acting in the capacity of a news person. Sounds like a pretty clear law, doesn't it? <laughs> Fox News senior judicial analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano uh, joins us now. How I'm, do you, how well, do you get sighing, around that I'm to compel sighing, her who her sources I'm, I'm were in I'm sighing because there are some loopholes to that law that you could drive a truck through. Shortly following the, the statement that you read, it says, except as follows. And one of the as follows is, when the court's need to know <laughs> is greater than the reporter's need to keep secret. Now, <clears throat> the court could claim, we're talking about a judge here, the court could claim that its need to know is great. You can't get into the judge's mind. You don't know what the judge is trying to figure out. They, they can't put her on the stand and make her answer questions, but they can put her in jail until she does cough up her source. Why do they want to know the source? The source presumably is somebody from law enforcement. Who else would have known about this notebook? This yeah, we, is the notebook. We should notebook. just go back. This is all okay. about, it's all about a notebook that James Holmes had. Because obviously you had the scene of the crime, the movie right. theater, then you had his apartment. Right. Uh, and she was able, she was given information on his diaries and things that he wrote. Uh, they had a gag order that came down. And the, the timing on when the gag order came down and when she revealed this story is one of the issues that will come up all right, in all of this. The service that she performed, the revelation of a truth is a profound good the public has a need and a desire to know it's a matter of material public interest and the question is what did the government know about James Holmes and when did it know it and we know from looking at these notebooks that the psychiatrist to whom the notebooks were delivered a government employee knew about this and knew about his his deranged mental state before these killings and informed the police. It is profound that the public knows that. Without Jaina's incredible work, the public would not have known that. So she not only didn't do anything wrong, she did a profound good by getting these notes and revealing their existence. And, and now the they want to put her in saying, jail. The defense is saying that somehow that this information that was revealed in that reporting uh, has made it difficult or impossible uh, for her, for their client, James Holmes, to get a fair trial. I don't think so. You know, it, it is the job of judges to find 12, in this case 16, because you have four alternates, uh, on the jury who can put aside what they know about the case and, and be truly fair. And that's what judges do. That's what judges are paid for. I did this thousands of times, and judges, judges know how to do this, and they shouldn't be looking for uh, shortcuts. The, the, the reason this is so important is because without whistleblowers, without the shield law, without reporters protecting their sources, when the government is involved, we would have to rely exclusively on the government for this information. The government is not very good about coming forward with information that makes it itself look bad. And that's why reporters and their sources need to be protected. The framers of our Constitution knew something about that. And they incorporated uh, it all in the, something called the First Amendment. I know you know a little something Amendment. about the Constitution. A little bit. <laughs> Judge, thank you. You're Wonderful welcome. to have you with us. We'll see you later. Pleasure, Martha. Well, in Guantanamo, uh, KSM faces the potential of death if he is convicted. Well, here in the civilian trial, Gates faces at most life in prison if he is convicted here in Lower Manhattan. Chef? Eric Sean live in Lower Manhattan for us this afternoon. Eric, thanks. Let's take this to the judge now. Fox News senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano, is in studio, in studio with us. Now, the reason he's there has more to do with the accusations and the charges than, than anything else in this Yes, case, right? yes, that's correct, uh, Shep. The, uh, the Supreme Court of the United States has ruled that conspiracy uh, to engage in acts of terrorism is not proscribed, made illegal by the laws of war. Mm. So the military tribunals in Guantanamo Bay can only try war crimes. It cannot try crimes that are not war crimes. And the government has chosen to charge him with conspiracy to aid a terrorist organization. The aid that the government says he provided consisted of his speeches and his propagandizing and his publicizing uh, Osama bin Laden's uh, efforts to kill people and, and boasting about those that he did kill. So that would not be a crime in, in a military tribunal, but only in a civilian court. Now, while you were speaking, there was a development downtown in Lower Manhattan. Our producer who was in the courtroom, just came out of the courtroom, mm -hmm. said that this proceeding is over and that the judge, for reasons that our people don't understand, didn't set a trial date. Well, we are a long way from a trial date. I mean, he was just brought before the court for the first time two weeks ago. Typically, the, the time between the first appearance and the actual summoning of the jury in the beginning of the trial in the federal system in the United States of America is about nine months. Mm. What happens in that nine months? 
He's examined by psychiatrists to make sure he can, he can communicate with his lawyers and that he's mentally sound. The government has to surrender its entire file to his lawyers and they have to look through it and they have to prepare a, a defense and they have to make applications to the court to limit the case to certain specific issues. All of that can take many, many months. Now, the accusation here is not, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's my understanding that the accusation is not that this man did something specifically, but that he said things. Yes. There's no accusation. This is why he's not exposed to the death penalty, Shep. There's no accusation that he committed any act of violence. The accusation is that he helped al-Qaeda by being its mouthpiece. It's a, it's a very interesting case because his lawyers are going to argue that under many Supreme Court cases, as, as horrific as were the words that he used and the things that he said, they were mere words and therefore protected under the Constitution. And then the government will say, well, wait a minute, these are words that publicized these horrific events and scared the daylights out of people and caused them misery who lost their loved ones and that caused harm and the court will have to decide. Mm, lots to do. Yes, lots to do, and right under our noses, right down where Eric Schoen and company can keep an eye on them. Jessica <laughs> Politano, thank you. You're welcome. Should be an easy case, but the fate of Fox News reporter Jana Winter and whether she should go to jail for not revealing her sources is still up in the air. A Colorado judge ruling he needs more time. Winter won't reveal the source that she used to break the story about a notebook James Holmes, the shooter out in Colorado, kept about the shooting. Fox News senior judicial analyst Judge Anna Napolitano is here to weigh in. Actually, the judge, it was, it was a much more important ruling late yesterday, right? What I was actually surprised with the ruling, but pleased with it. I mean, in my own view and, and my view of the law and the Constitution is that reporters should not be forced to divulge their uh, sources. If they are, the sources will dry up and we'll have to rely on the government for telling us what's going on. And the government is, is not known for transparency and, and truth telling, especially if it's going to embarrass itself. But what the judge did yesterday, this is the same judge who's presiding at the trial of Mr. Holmes, was to say, look, I don't know if this book, this notebook that the defendant wrote and gave to his treating psychiatrist, an employee of the state of Colorado, is going to be admissible in evidence in, tr in the case against him. If it's not, <clears throat> then this big dispute about how the reporter, how Jana learned about it is irrelevant, <clears throat> pardon me, and I'm going to dismiss the, uh, the case against her, and she's not going to go to uh, trial. So first, she's not so, going to go to so jail. So what the judge is saying is that uh, he wants to wait to see, and it has to do with whether or not the defense decides to, or the prosecution decides to uh, have this be an insanity case or not, right? Well, the, the, the prosecution will first decide whether or not they want to seek the death penalty. It seems as though they're going to do that. They haven't definitively decided it yet. Then the defense has to decide, are they going to invoke insanity? If the defense invokes insanity, the government has to prove to a jury that he was insane at the time of the crime, insane at the time of the trial, and insane at the time of the execution. Uh, excuse me, the government had to prove that he was sane at the time of the trial, the crime, and the execution. So that's a big hurdle. The defense has not yet decided whether or not it's going to invoke the insanity defense. If it does, the book is relevant. Okay, so explain, his, his musings to his psychiatrist. Explain why that's relevant in an insanity defense, but not, and why that, how that all factors back into this reporter and whether or not she'll have to go to jail. If, if there's no insanity defense here, then the only real issue is whether or not he gets life in prison or execution. There's, no, there's not much of a dispute at all, okay. but that he is the human being that caused this, uh, caused this slaughter. So if his mental state is not an issue in the trial, that is, there's no dispute about his sanity or insanity, then it doesn't matter what he told his psychiatrist. Remember, this is a book in which he wrote some bizarre fantasies that he gave to his psychiatrist. So the issue is, what did the psychiatrist know and when did she know it? What did she tell the police and when did they know it? And why did the police do nothing to stop him? That is an entirely different issue from does he deserve life in jail or execution for the slaughter that he caused? So meantime, this reporter, Jana Winter, has to sit and wait. Well, I think she'll probably be, probably be back in New York soon, but when there is a hearing in Colorado, she needs uh, to be there. I've interviewed her. She's a very, she's a colleague of ours. She's a serious, mature reporter who performed a profound service to the world by revealing the existence of this, and it's none of the government's business how she got this information. It was truthful, and it was accurate, and it was timely. Interesting case. Uh, Judge Andrew Napolitano, thanks much. Pleasure.
TARP ARE JUST CRAP. You, YOU HEAR ABOUT THIS ONE? A LOT OF BANKS THAT RECEIVE TARP DOUGH RIGHT AFTER THE MELTDOWN ARE USING OTHER GOVERNMENT AID TO PAY BACK THOSE BAILOUT LOANS. Now, THAT IS SORT OF LIKE YOU AND ME PAYING OUR VISA BILL WITH OUR MASTERCARD. NOW, IT'S KIND OF SCREWY. But kind of no surprise to our own Judge Andrew DiPolitano, who had solved him, warned about this very thing happening years ago in the middle of a meltdown. That was then, the judge with me right now. But it is weird, Judge. It is, it is very, very weird. First of all, when, when the government force feeds you cash, some people wanted the cash, those banks were about to go under. Some banks didn't need the cash. There's no provision in the Constitution for the government picking which industries. But it's you're right. Gonna, a lot of them didn't save. want the cash and said, "No, you better take the cash." They were told. Right. This is now public. They were told if they didn't take the cash, if they didn't take the government's billions, create a sh class of stock and sell it to the government for billions, that they would be the subject of ruinous audits by the FDIC. And as a result, the top 60 banks in the U.S. were forced to take. Uh, TARP money. Some of them needed it. Some of them didn't. It wasn't justified under the Constitution for any of them. The government is not in the business of picking winners and losers. Now we learn that some of them, in order to pay the government back, borrowed or received other grants from the very same government that they were paying back. Could you imagine the absurdity of, uh, you owe me money. I'll lend you the money with which to pay me back the money that you owe me. That is literally what was done with taxpayer dollars. That is a. I didn't understand that, but I'm offended by that. That but, is a zero. But net then why do we let it happen? Growth. Why aren't there provisos just that you can't pull this? Because the government wants to give the impression, just as it did from TARP, which President Bush said he was doing. To, to save the free market, even though he was assaulting free market principles. The government wants to give the impression that it's doing something. It wants to give the impression to the American public that it's doing something to help them. It did nothing to help them. It saddled them with additional debt. The 18 billion in TARP hasn't been paid back. Interest is running on it. We're paying the interest on it, hasn't been paid back. But you better be careful what you get because I just want to show this. Those banks that got this money and are now switching funds around, um, they're not lending as much, bottom line. Correct. Are we surprised? Well, we actually should be surprised that they're, not, that they're not lending as much. I mean, when the government diverts funds to an industry or to a t particular bank, it gives you an artificial view of that bank's worth. It makes it look better than it really is. That brings other investors in who are investing in something that's really riskier than it but appears to be. But it's not working. Be. It's not working because the, the purpose of TARP was to shore up the banks so they would lend money to small businesses and individuals which would generate economic activity. They're lending less, not more. They're afraid to part with the money that they got from the feds which bailed them out. This is a, a ruinous circle that the federal government started in 2008 and that now continues. I'm, I'm not surprised that they're using federal funds to pay the federal government back with, but it's preposterous. It's absurd. It doesn't advance the economic ball at all. What do I really think about it? Yeah, really. I was going to say, you know, <laughs> tell us how you feel. Like Lou before, tell us how you feel. It's, it's, right. it's frustrating uh, right, that, yeah. that basic principles of economics 101 are being violated by the people that we have elected to, to preserve the Constitution. Judge, always great. Thank you, sir. Pleasure, Neil. It's the countdown to the tax filing deadline, and now there's a new warning that the IRS may be collecting more than just your money. Could it be collecting data as well from your computer to make sure that you didn't cheat? The agency admits it might check social media websites and private email. So is that legal? Let's ask Fox News Senior Judicial Analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano, who's going to have a field day with this one, Yeah, I well, imagine. you know, there's no end to the shortcuts that uh, the government will take to try and make its own job easier and basically say, oh, keep the Constitution in the drawer. <laughs> can, can they look at uh, social websites? Of course. So if you, if you take a trip to the Caribbean and you deduct the cost because you say it's a, a business trip, mm -hmm. but you also show pictures of that trip to your Facebook friends of you being un, decidedly unbusinesslike and it looks more like a vacation because those pictures were published to a large group of people, may even be on a public website, depending upon where you posted it, of course the IRS can look at that. So they can look at anything that is public, that you knowingly make public, and compare it with what you tell them in private. The more problematic one, which we just learned about last night from a freedom of information request that was responded to by the IRS and revealed by the people who made the request, is that the IRS has been claiming for a couple of years now that it can read private emails. And the IRS's argument is, if you 
Gretchen Carlson, send me, Andrew Napolitano, an email. You don't have any expectation of privacy because you sent it to me. That is utterly laughable and has been rejected by the court. You intend it just for me. Therefore, the privacy is for everybody else. But how would they get into those emails? Well, remember, they're doing this without a warrant. If they had reason to believe that either of us was committing a crime, they would present those reasons to a judge. The judge would give them a search warrant. They'd present the search warrant to the company that operates the server that you use, and that company would presumably comply with the search warrant and let them tap in. But they want to tap in without a search warrant, so they have to go to the company, whoever the server may be, Verizon, Google, uh, whoever it is, Microsoft, and say, uh, we want to uh, read what Carlson's been saying to Napolitano. Uh, do us a favor and let us in. <laughs> That's what's been going on. And these companies would say yes? Well, Google has a history of saying no and of challenging the government when the government comes knocking. Not all the other companies do that. Most of the other servers go along with requests from the government. Why? Because they feel like then maybe they won't be targeted? Well, I don't know what goes through their minds, but that's a, that's a reasonable explanation, Mrs. Carlson. All right. Lady Mr. In Napolitano, <laughs> man in red tie. And that's what I'm, and I'm going to send you an email about that later. <laughs> and the IRS is not going to get their hands on it. <laughs> All right. Good to see you, Hopefully. Jeff. Have Pleasure. a good day. Sure. Tax days less than a week away, and the American Civil Liberties Union is looking into whether the IRS is reading more than just your tax returns. ACLU workers filed a Freedom of Information request asking whether the IRS is reading private emails without a warrant. If true, that could be a violation of the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution, a guarantee against unreasonable searches. There are many layers to this story. The Fox Sports Chief Correspondent Jonathan Hunt's been looking into it all day. At the very least, the IRS rules are unclear. Yeah, this is a lot more complicated than we thought it was when we first looked at the headlines this morning, Shep. Here's uh, something from the Internal Revenue Manual, Part 9, written in 2009. Quote, the government may obtain the contents of an electronic communication that has been in storage for more than 180 days using a search warrant, a court order, or a grand jury subpoena or administrative summons. Now, the ACLU attorney who first wrote this, Nathan Wessler, believes that sentence should end at search warrant, but it goes on. The problem here is the administrative summons, according to the ACLU. That essentially means, Shep, that two IRS agents can talk to each other, decide these emails are relevant, and then go to the internet service provider and say, we need those emails. It's just them deciding that. That's the problem here, according to them, that they don't have to bring in the courts. On the other hand, the internet service providers in most cases would say they will not hand over that information without a search warrant. So it's not black and white, but it's precisely the areas of gray that are of concern here. Mm -hmm. What's the IRS saying? IRS isn't saying anything right now. Uh, we reached out to IRS officials. They said they may send a statement later in the day about this, but we have heard nothing as yet. The ACLU, meantime, has put out a statement paraphrasing the work of the attorney, Nathan Wessler, saying, quote, the IRS should tell the public whether it always gets a warrant to access email and other private communications in the course of criminal investigations. And if the agency does not get a warrant, it should change its policy to to always require one. So in the view of the ACLU, it is in fact black and white. Tell us whether you always get a search warrant or not. As simple as that. All right, Jonathan, let's bring in the judge now. Fox News senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano is here. I'm a little confused. Well, uh, uh, Jonathan has accurately described this. First, it is very complex. Now, he and I both read the regulations this afternoon. It's uh, about three and a half inches thick, single spaced. Mm. So you have to sort of zero in on what you're looking for. So a couple of basics. The IRS does not have the time or the inclination willy-nilly to start reading people's emails. We're talking about cases where the IRS believes there's criminal fraud involved. So these are criminal investigations. A very, very, very tiny percentage of taxpayers uh, may be involved in being investigated for crimes by the IRS. What does the IRS do in order to get information to build a case against these taxpayers? It's supposed to use a search warrant. But according to these regulations, there are circumstances under which it can go to the service provider, the computer company, and say, these emails have been here for 180 days. They have, they've been opened. They haven't been deleted. Don't you think that this person doesn't care if anybody reads them, that they wouldn't leave them there for 180 days where your employees can read them? So we're going to give you a subpoena. I'm authorizing my IRS colleague to take these emails from you. Now, the person who put the emails there 
received it, opened it, and didn't delete it, may never know that these emails have been taken by the IRS because they may not form the basis of a criminal prosecution, they may never be used against this person, and they'll just go on, uh, go on with their merry life. The only way this comes into play is if the IRS wants to use in a court of law these emails. Then the IRS will have to explain to a judge how they got it, and then the judge will say, well, how is that consistent with the Fourth Amendment? You didn't come to me and ask for a search warrant, you just went and took it. There's so many more instances of elements of the government or authority figures in this country well, delving yes. into our stuff. Yes, Stay now Stay out of our stuff. We, we it's learned, our stuff. We it's learned, not your stuff. It's our stuff. We learned earlier this week that the IRS is using the social media. That's lawful. If, if I put something on my social media for anybody to look at who, who logs on to that, sure. the IRS can look at that's it. That's like that's saying a billboard. it out loud to an IRS agent. Exactly, exactly. So that's actually a prudent thing for the IRS to do. But what the ACLU, in my view, quite properly wants to know is, are you following your own regulations which tell you how to get around the Fourth Amendment, or are you following the Fourth Amendment? And the IRS, as Jonathan indicated, has not yet answered that question. But hopefully they will. Yes. You know, you know what happens next, though. Anybody they suspect of cheating, they just drone them. <laughs> there are plenty of drones. I don't think the IRS owns the drones yet, but no. their, their colleagues in, uh, in Homeland Security do. Yet being the operative word. Yeah, if they want drones, they'll get... Everybody should have a drone. Let's not go there. It's coming, Judge. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome, my friend.